better? Yeah, it's very good now. Wonderful. It's good. It's testing time, uh, the technology time. Uh, in the previous years before the 2020, when the COVID stuck, it was a fantastic way to do the webinars, to do the seminars. Uh, we always did the seminars. So it was great for us because we were in, in present in person. We could address the issues. We could serve you the coffee and uh, we could have a nice lunch after that. But now because of the COVID situation and because of uh, the technological development, we are more into the webinar aspect of all the things. So first of all, I would like to welcome you all to the first time home buyer webinar conducted by team. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to be present here, to be having a word with you. Guys, before we start, few words of advice. As we mentioned, this is an informal seminar. Please raise your question. There's a chat box there. Please mention your questions over there. Uh, if there is something which is concerning your own personal needs, we would be able to address them after the webinar. You can talk to the teammate, you can talk to the person who invited you. Likewise, if there is a general question you want me to address, I'll be more than addressed to all the questions as such. Now, when we talk about uh, being a first time home buying experience, just to give you a little bit of my introduction, I've been in the country 20 years. 20 years when Google was not that great, probably the searches were from the Yahoo search engine. There was a lot of, uh, there was not as much information available as it is now. So what happens is when there was not no much information, we relied on the help of friends. We relied on the help of our landlord. We relied on the help of our co-workers who could give us any information about what process is it. But now in this present age, along with a lot of information being available, the difficult aspect is there is a lot of misinformation available. All of us think, feel, we are very much attached to the university of Facebook, the university of WhatsApp. So we think we know a lot of stuff, but there's a lot of misinformation available as well. And that we will uncover, that we will cover with our journey as we go along. So now when we talk about when I came to the country 20 years ago, a lot of lack of information available. We tried to figure out when we were trying to buy our own house, who to check from, who to ask from. A lot of people gave us information and with best use judgment, we did our step. And we realized that there were a lot of other benefits, the plans, the government benefits, what we could have taken. So giving it back to the community, I've been in the business for 17 years and we took a mandate that what we're gonna do is we're gonna educate the people. We're gonna have this information sessions where we can plan. It's not about doing the, buying the property. It's about the steps we're gonna take to accomplish the goal, whether it is right now, whether it is in two years from now, these are the baby steps, what we're gonna start, what we're gonna take in order to realize the dream of our first time home buying. Why are we here? When we talk about, when we come to this country, there are four major aspects we come here. When we come to the country, the biggest aspect, the first the word H, it stands for home buying. We want to have that process. We want to have, make sure we can have our property as soon as possible. The first goal is to get our home. The second goal is to get the home paid off. So H, second aspect is the education planning. When we talk about the education about our own selves, upgrading our own needs, education planning for our kids. Third is R, the retirement planning. And fourth is E, the estate aspect, how effectively we can transfer the estate to our kids. 
whatever we have earned. So in this webinar, you're going to be getting a lot of information based on all the aspects of H-E-R-E, -E, home, education, retirement, and estate. Whatever you earn in this country between you and your spouses is okay. But whenever it's going to be transferred to the kids, it is taxed at the fair market value. It's taxed like it's you're selling it to them. So very important aspect when we talk about home, when we talk about education, how we're going to plan for it, how we're going to work on it. So today's webinar is going to be focused on first time home buying experience. As I said, 17 years into the country, our focus, what we do, our specialities, we work with first time home buyers because there are a lot of government benefits, there are a lot of plans what we're going to cover, what we miss in this journey. And today we're going to be talking about all those aspects ourselves. Second is when you are able to buy your property, you plan to do build your assets and you want to be an investor, want to make sure whatever you input, you get it back in multiple folds. Two very separate different classes of people. First time home buyer want to be very close to their needs. First time home buyer, the vicinity to the school, malls, highway, very, very important. The feel factor, you want to be too centric to your all your needs. Investors, different ball game altogether because what we input and what we output is a question. So today we're going to be focusing on first time home buying experience. In last 17 years, although our prime area of work has been GTA, Toronto, Peel, Halton, Durham, Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, London, but our clients have taken us as far as Niagara Falls, as far as Peterborough, as far as Queeny West. So we've helped clients in all these areas, but bigger chunk, most bigger aspect, we concentrate on GTA, Kitchener Waterloo area and London. We're gonna be talking about what are the hot areas coming up, which is the new area where you can focus and make a lot of good return on your investment. Now our mission, our mission, as we say, is educate, educate, educate. It's the purpose of education. The more education we are able to get in the process. You may be buying 10 properties in your life. You may be buying 20 properties in your life. But what is important is the benefits attached to the first time home buying are very unique and special, which are not the same. Investment property is different. So our goal is we educate our clients, we build successful teams, and then we have satisfied clients. What we believe as a mantra in the aspect is not about the first aspect, because when you as a first time home buyer move into your property, when you feel that everything what we said, did, and the journey was great, when you put your name and refer us the client, that is what is the biggest reward, what we believe is what we get. When somebody's going to put their name, my grandfather used to say all the time, can you put your name to this? Can you put, if you can put your name to it, and when you put your name and tell people about a great experience, like a lot of you would be invited here today by one, one of the teammates, one of your friends would have referred. Why? Because what we believe, what we did is we served them and they had a great experience. Now they want to extend the experience. 
with the advent of Google and the Facebook and the social media, word of mouth still and will be always the best source of advertisement. That is what we believe in. Now, embarking on the journey, I know a lot of you would be having a lot of questions in the mind. The first aspect, what should I buy? Whether I should buy a detached property, I should buy a semi-detached property, I should buy a townhouse, is condo a good buy? A lot of time when I go to social media, I read all of negative views about condo. Is it a good, is it bad? What should I buy? So we're gonna cover all the aspect there. The biggest question, what is the down payment required? In the last one year, we have received so many calls from people who are on work permit. We've got so many calls from students. We've got so many calls who are non-resident people in US wanting to invest in Canada, having lack of information on what could, should be the down payment. Do we need 20%? Do we need 30%? Is the, if I'm a student, do I have to pay 15% extra tax? So a lot of questions stay in the mind, what should be the down payment? And we're gonna uncover that as well in today's topic. Next aspect is what should be my monthly budget? Some of you might be able to pay 10,000 as a down payment. Some of you could be able to pay 20,000 or 200,000, irrespective whether I pay 10, 15, 20 or 100, whatever, the most important component of my aspect is what is my monthly budget? Whether I like it or I don't like it, first of every month, the bank or the lender is automatically going to take the money from my account, pre-authorized withdrawal setup. So what is going to be my monthly budget? What are all the components of monthly budget? We're going to discover, uncover everything in a while as well. Another aspect, should I take a mortgage? What kind of mortgage should I take? Should I take a private mortgage? Should I take a variable mortgage? Should I take a fixed mortgage? Interest only mortgage, what type of aspect? We're going to cover that as well. And finally, what is my closing cost? What is the money I require to legally get the title on my name? So we understand these are all the questions what you have in your mind. So all these questions, sometimes we're trying to do it Google, which leads to a confusion, which leads to an idea what to do. But we are here to provide you the counseling on all the aspect. We are here to provide you information based what should or what could you do. And we are able to give you the guidance in order to make you best use of the information you have with you. Now, the first aspect. The first aspect we're going to talk is monthly budget. I see a lot of you asking this question to me, what is going to be my monthly budget? Because some of you as a students might be able to get the down payment arranged from the parents. So what should be my monthly budget? The first important aspect in the monthly budget is the mortgage cost. The mortgage, what bank is going to take from your account on first of every month. Second aspect is the property tax. The property tax is collected by our city because city provides us with 
security, policing services, transit services, garbage removal, snow removal, and many other aspects. So property tax is another cost which we calculate on monthly basis, whether we pay annually or not, but we calculate on the monthly basis. Just to tell you, even if you have a mortgage on the property, if the lender is the one who's the bank is the one who's given you a mortgage, the first right on the property belongs to the city because it's their land. So they want to make sure the property tax is paid. Third thing is utilities. We need heat, we need hydro, we need electricity, we need water, we need insurance on the property. So we all clubbed it under utilities. In case you're buying a townhouse or a condo or a high rise, there could be, there is always a maintenance fee. Now maintenance fee is directly proportional to all the cost or all the benefits what we need in that building. So assuming there's a high rise, an apartment, a building in which there are 100 units. So depending upon what is the security cost, if you need a security buzzer over there, what is the cost to heat the common elements? So all those aspects come under maintenance fee. Sometimes the maintenance fee include all the utilities. So it's a common expense, common heat, hydro, electricity. I see there's a question from a chat. So let me address that as well. Somehow the chat box doesn't like to talk to me at the moment. So the question I'll... is, is property tax lower for condos and townhouses? Fantastic. Very good question. And thank you for addressing and thank you, Chetanji. For... Is property tax lower for condo and townhouses? The general answer or is yes, it is lower. Property tax has 42 components to it. When we say 42 components, one of the component is the price of the property. So if I'm comparing a $2 million condo in downtown versus a $1 million property in Brampton, condo will have a higher price. But if we compare for a first time home buyer, a generic aspect, a semi-detached property, a detached property, would have a higher property tax compared to the condo as of now. As I say, property tax has 42 different components. To explain you in an easy manner, Toronto, city of Toronto has less property tax. Mississauga has more than Toronto and city of Brampton has more than city of Mississauga. Why I covered these three is to explain you the difference. In city of Toronto, there are more businesses, corporate companies. So since there are more businesses and businesses pay a higher amount of property tax, the burden on the individual owners is less. City of Mississauga has the highest presence of Fortune 500 companies. So their property tax is relatively less. If we compare apples to apples, a same property in city of Brampton and in city of Mississauga, city of Mississauga has a lease tax. But if we compare a condo to a detached property to condo, yes, a condo would have a lesser property tax because a lot of the expenses like garbage removal, if the detached properties the garbage removal has an extra cost, but in, in a condo building, they come and pick it from one point. A lot of the other benefits are also there 
in the which are taken care in the maintenance fee so to answer your question yes the property tax on the condos is less compared to detached or a semi detached property thank you for asking the question and clearing the doubts of lot of other people who had that in the mind but couldn't ask so as i was saying the maintenance fee the prop option is the maintenance fee could cover everything water hydro heat and all the other benefits the common area maintenance everything but the newer buildings which are coming right now are the ones which are coming with pay as you go basis if you need heat you pay accordingly if there is a need heat you can shift your temperature if you need electricity as much as you use you pay for it because what it has been seen in the past when it's a common fund there's lot of wastage a simple example i am on the board of commercial property for the property management what we've seen is the water bill is extraordinary high so what we did is we metered the individual units and we reduced it because the leakage in one unit or the second unit was the one which was costing a huge amount of money to every other owner so similarly if all of us live in one building and assuming there's a leakage in my unit you all guys suffer accordingly because you share the cost so what is happening is in the newer buildings the mindset adjustment is shift everything to the owners so that there could be reduction of wastage of the resources and everybody pay as you go another aspect of it is special assessment in a condo building when a condo building is made for first 15 years the maintenance fee is generally low and then it tends to increase and the reason it tends to increase is there could be a possibility of a huge expense coming on the way huge expenses a typical lifeline of a garage or a parking is 20 to 25 years so there could be expenses coming up for the improvement of that one condo buildings have flat roof big expense in 20 25 years so if the building is not maintained well what happens is the expenses for these aspect have to be maintained and there could be special assessment levied now this special assessment can be of huge amount so a thumb rule is if there is a special assessment in the building don't buy it it's not managed well it's relatively old so there could be lot of questions and concerns make sure you do your due diligence 10 times more before buying anything with the special assessment next cost is fire insurance all the property here all the properties are made of wood right there are drywall components to it what if we share a semi detached property and if you have a semi detached property god forbid the neighbor house catches fire and there's a damage so since we have a mortgage on the property the lender always ask us to maintain fire insurance it's a requirement if we do not have the insurance for the property the lawyer is not going to close it and you're not going to get the keys and final aspect 
of monthly budget is mortgage insurance since you're going to be taking a debt on your head for 700 800 500 000 god forbid something happens to the breadwinner of the family what happens to the family mortgage insurance and life insurance are two different aspects we're going to cover that aspect in detail in time to come as well so when a lot of you have a question we can cover those aspects too now when we talk about what it is it's a time to plan ahead it's time to prepare a road map lot of you would be contemplating to buy the property in 2021 22 23 24 and beyond the time to think and plan is now the time to do the savings is now first 60 days of the year are absolutely crucial because they can help you improve your bottom line or net worth and we're going to talk about that as well so even if you are new to the country and you want to plan those aspect the time to think is now start up with whatever small amount of savings you can do and okay i have a question can i buy house on work permit if yes how chaya your answer your answer is yes you can buy the house on work permit there are lenders available in the top 5 banks who will be able to give you the mortgage as well and let me tell you an interesting aspect you can go as low as 10% down payment with the 10% down payment if you are on the work permit you can buy a property there are other aspects to that and i'm going to take those things i'll hold on this question too and i'm going to take that question in time to come as well but thank you chaya thanks for asking the question i think i have a follow up question for that as well you welcome chaya you welcome next now when we talk about preparing the road map when we going to do our analysis of what we going to do how we going to do and what's going to be our steps let's look at the step of what is going to be my cost what is going to be expenses attached the first aspect is the down payment as i answer chaya yes you can buy with as low as 10% even when you are on the work permit so down payment has lot of questions in the money some of you might think that you need to have 35% some of you might think you need 20% some of you think you can buy it with 5% vibhar i got your question i'm going to answer that as well so down payment is a big aspect a general aspect is if you are permanent resident of the country or your citizen of the country you can go as low as 5% yes you heard it right if you are permanent resident of the country if you're citizen of the country you can go as low as down payment of 5% but if you are a work permit a special case basis you need at least 10% down payment there are certain conditions to that as well it may not happen that your work permit is only 6 months left to it how long is a work permit is the biggest question which, which comes into the fray are you under a temporary job for example there are lot of farm workers which come and work in the country for 6 months and then they go back 
this is a difficult scenario for them. But if you are a regular job into the IT industry, into the aspect having a work permit of two, three, four years, it's not difficult at all to have it. So you can go with a down payment of 10%. Interesting aspect for students. And as, as they get a lot of it, do you need 20%? Do you need 35%? We're going to cover that aspect in a while as well. So first aspect of the cost is the down payment. The second is the closing cost. The thumb rule for this is whatever the cost of the property is, 1.5% is the closing cost. This is the way to calculate what is the outgoing money from our pocket. So if you're buying a property for 600,000, 600 times 1.5, is you should budget $7,500. If you're buying a property for $800,000, 1.5%, 12,000 is what you should budget for the closing cost. And third aspect is CMHC fees. Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation fee. Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation fee is the one which enables us to buy the property as 5%. A fantastic question somebody has asked is, if a person has PR, but working in the other country, will he be considered resident or external buyer? Fantastic question. So. If a person has PR, so somebody who's on permanent resident basis, but working in the other country. For example, let's take an example. If he's working in India or if he's working in US, if you are the permanent resident, first step is how are you gainfully employed? If you are employed, for a Canadian corporation, let's take an example. Prashant, who's asked the question, is a PR, and I have an IT company which is present in Canada, which is present in US, which is present in India, and Prashant is working in India. He's working for a Canadian company in an overseas location. He's considered as a resident buyer. But once Prashant gets citizenship and now he chooses to work in US or anywhere else, it depends on what his tax relationship with the country is. Is he non-resident for the tax purposes or not? It's a complicated situation in the tax aspect too. But for a PR, if his PR working in the other country, depends whether he's working for the Canadian company. If he's working for Canadian company, his days for the citizenship would be taken as, and he's considered as a resident buyer. One tip I will give, because it's a very important question, for every buyer in this country, mark my words, for every buyer in this country, there is a mortgage option available. If the banks are able to give loan to a non-resident buyer, somebody who's not a present in the country, if somebody is present in the country, there are a lot of options available and there are lenders available to give funding as well. Vibor had a question and he talks about, and he asks about how to calculate price affordability for house based on annual income. Weber, I'll give you a very clear example, whatever the income is, X family income, $100,000, the lender will give you five to five and a half times from 500 to $550,000 of mortgage amount. So if the family income is $100,000, you've multiplied by five to 5.5, that's the amount of money you can get in the mortgage aspect. 
Now, if you want to give a down payment of 100,000, 200,000, you can add. Let's assume if you want to buy a more, if you want to give a down payment of 100,000, you can buy a property for 550 plus 100, 650. This is a generic way to calculate it. Although when we get the credit information, what are the debts outstanding? If you bought a Mercedes where the, where the payment is $1,000 a month, it's surely going to impact your buying power. So coming to the cost, first cost is the down payment. We can go 35%, 20%, 15%, as low as 5%. Second cost is closing cost. The thumb rule to calculate is 1.5% cost of the property. And third is the CMHC fee, which is indirectly added. We pay for it. CMHC fee stands for Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation fee, which allows people to go as low as 5% down payment. What are the CMHC fee? How it's calculated? We're going to be talking on that as well. Now we talk about the government programs available for the first time home buying. First aspect is 5% down payment program. And then we talk about CMHC fees as well. Let's assume we are buying a house for 800,000. So 5% of that is $40,000. With $40,000 in my pocket, I can go to a lender and ask lender, Mr. Lender, give me $760,000 because I want to buy a house for $800,000. And the lender, after the due diligence and checking, they may allow that as well. With a 5% down payment, we can own a property up to a million dollars, provided we get it in the terms of the mortgage qualification. How it happens is when we are coming with 5% down payment, the lender feels the lender is at a big risk because the lender is putting 95%. You as a borrower or a buyer are putting 5%, but still lender is ready to give you a mortgage because the government body, CMHC, Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation, steps in. They say to the lender, to the bank, that we are okay to give this guy, Mr. Bank, please give the loan to them. We'll take the insurance from amount from the borrower from a first time buyer and will insure your money so your money is not at risk. So that way, the bank is secured. As a first time buyer, you are able to realize your dream and will go as low as 5% down payment. The second aspect is RRSP Home Buyers Plan. If you're going to take one thing from this webinar today, make sure you understand this concept very well. Eight out of 10 first time home buyers in the excitement of buying the home miss this aspect. And as I said, if you're going to remember just one thing out of this webinar, make sure you understand this concept well. I'll be here to repeat, discuss, explain this concept n number of times until everybody feels that they got it right. So RRSP, Home Buyers Plan, Registered Retirement Savings Plan for Home Buyers. Very important aspect, and we're gonna see how we cover it, and we're gonna cover this in detail. Third aspect is CMHC, Flexible Financing. Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation, flexible financing for newcomers, which we explained earlier, as low as 5%, self-employed, IT professionals, Uber drivers, taxi drivers, real estate professionals, all those who are self-employed, 
15 years ago, it was very difficult to get mortgage. Right now, there are options available easily with which people can realize their dream. Next aspect, home buyer tax credit. Home buyer tax credit means, I will explain it a very little, literal sense. If you are buying a home in 2021, when you go in 2022 to your accountant to do your taxes, you're going to go up to $750 in tax refund back. Home buyer tax credit. You buy the house in 2021. When you go and do your taxes, you get up to $750. Next aspect, HST new housing rebate. Assuming you are a first time home buyer, because we're talking about all this aspect, you go to a builder and say, I want to buy a property. Builder says, fine. So what's the cost? Cost is 500,000. You say, I'm fine. I have the money for 500,000. I can go and buy my property. At the time of closing, when we go to Walmart, when we go to any aspect in any store, we pay 13% tax, HST. But if at the time of closing, we go to the builder and builder says, there's a tax of 13%, which is $65,000, it may spoil, and it's purely gonna spoil all the planning because $65,000 is huge, huge amount. So what happens is if you are a first time home buyer and you're planning to buy a property for the first time for, a for, for the use of your own stay, what you see is what you get. May I request uh, you know, uh, everybody to please mute. There's some impending sound at the back, which is disturbing to everyone. Thank you. HST, new housing rebate. Next aspect, land transfer tax rebate. Remember we talked about the closing cost. The closing cost was one and a half percent of the purchase price. So if you're a first time home buyer, you can qualify for $4,000 rebate in land transfer tax, which is applicable right away. So it means this is money not coming in the taxes. This is money coming to your pocket right away, right at that time. You actually pay less property tax. It's an instant rebate that by the uh, lawyer does the paperwork and applies to applies for that and you get you pay less money at the time of closing costs. So your closing cost is reduced by $4,000 at the time. Various municipal and provincial federal plans. Make sure you are very well aware of all the provincial and municipal plans when you're buying the first time home buy. Provincial plans, like when I bought my house, there were options called as Ontario New Home Ownership Savings Plan, OHOSP, which was later scrapped. OHOSP was a great opportunity because the bottom line was you put 2000 for savings, the government give you $500 right away. 25% return on your money right away. All you go to the bank, says put the money in OHOSP. Plan is later scrapped. Municipal plan. Peel region gives lot of rebate to people who want to come and settle in Peel region. Up to 15,000, 20,000, even up to $25,000. But there are conditions which come. The conditions are there and the funding is limited to. A couple of years back, CMHC came with the plan where CMHC would be able to share and contribute for the down payment for 5% or 10% as well. Right, so make sure you take advantage of that. You have a realtor qualified who works with you in your best interest. So 
recovering it back, government programs, we can go as low as 5% down payment. RRSP home buyers plan, which we're gonna cover in detail because this is single most achievement you should be taking from today's webinar. CMHC flexible financing, home buyer tax credit, HST rebate, land transfer tax rebate. If you have any questions in the government plans, please make sure you ask now or later as well. I'll just leave this for a couple of seconds in order you wanna take a picture or so. Next aspect. Now we're gonna do an analysis of what it's gonna to cost to own a semi-detached property. Yeah, see, I see a question flaring. Can you please explain the HST new housing rebate again? Sure, John, I will surely explain, thank you. We're gonna take an example of, if you go to a builder and the builder has marked the price as $500,000, okay? So the builder is gonna ask you, John, are you a first time home buyer? You say, yes, I'm a first time home buyer. So builder says the actual cost of this house was $525,000. But since you are a first time home buyer, there is a $25,000 credit, which is gonna to come to you. But I'm gonna apply on your behalf to the government and get that credit coming to the builder because I'm gonna reduce the cost up to 500,000. I'm not selling you 525, so you don't have to pay and get a rebate. I'm selling you less, so the builder gets the document, the bunch of paper, thousand papers you sign with the builder, tells that the new housing rebate comes to the builder. But let's assume I go to the same builder and he asks me, Mr. Bedi, are you a first time home buyer? I said, no. Is this property for investment? Yes. So what happens is you cannot get that rebate qualified you deal with CRA at the time of closing. So at the time of closing, I would have to pay my down payment. I would have to pay my closing cost and I would have to pay the HST component. The reason I use $25,000 in the calculation because it's a very typical calculation, effective result which comes because there's a provincial rebate, there's a federal rebate, for a property up to $500,000, the HST component is approximately $25,000 to $27,000. I hope, John, that cleared some aspect. If not, please mention it in the chat box. I'll be more than glad to explain it back again. Thank you, yes. Thank you, John. Thank you for the feedback. Guys, I must say I'm loving it. Because when you ask the questions, it means you're attentive, it keeps me focused, and uh, it addresses a lot of questions in the mind of other listeners who might be a little shy to ask. Thank you for participation. Now we talk about cost to own a semi-detached property. Let's assume the property value to be $700,000 and the buyer or you're paying 10%. So 10% of 700 is $70,000 down payment. Balance is 630,000, 700 minus 70. Remember we talked about CMHC, Canada Mortgage Housing Corporation fee, that is $19,000. There's a formula to calculate it. It's available on my website. If you go to www.sunnybedi.com and you put what is the value of property you're gonna buy, it will tell you if you're paying 5%, 10%, 15% and 20%, what is the CMHC fee? Just to tell you, if you are paying more than 20%, there is no CMHC fee attached to it. 
Now, 630 plus 19 is 649,000 dollars. The monthly mortgage payment on this is 2,971. The estimated property tax we use because we are not mentioning any specific city, whether it's Mississauga or Brampton, so we're taking a generic value of $350. Utilities, $350 per month, which means $4,200 a year. And if you're using utilities more than $4,200 a year, you need to seriously introspect because it means a lot of wastage there. So 2971 of mortgage, 350 of property tax, 350 of utilities, the total cost per month is 3671. 3671 dollars per month. Now whether you like it or not, your budget, you should be mentally prepared for $3,671 a month. That's the cost which is going to go every month for your property. Now, a lot of first time home buyers like to rent the basements. It purely depends upon your lifestyle. You may want to do it, you may not want to do it. What is giving you comfort? What is giving you peace of mind? That is what it is important. Not that you got to rent out. As I say, a lot of first time home buyers, they like to rent the basement out. And we used an estimated rental value of $1,500. So $3,671 minus $1,500, $21. $71 is what will go. And as I retreat the fact again, you should be mentally ready for $36.71. Whether you rent it or you don't rent it is your personal choice. Whether you rent the upper level and live in the basement, purely your choice. But this is the amount of calculation you got to be prepared when you're buying first property. Now, a lot of it, as I said in the discussion, people ask, what if you want to buy a condo? Is condo buying better? So what we're going to do is we're going to take similar example and take a condo for 400,000 and do the numbers. So 400,000 cost of the condo, 10% down payment, CMHC fee, the mortgage required is 371. Let me tell you, we've used the higher rates as of prevailing rates. Whatever the rates are going right now, we use higher than what is present rates just to have that buffer in the gap. Because I know some of you are going to go to my website quickly, use the best rates possible, then say, Sunny, this is a higher value. I know. We took that as a buffer so that if the expenses monthly are less, good for you. So monthly mortgage payment, 1852, property tax, $160. See the difference? When we were comparing a house, we took a value of 350. Now we took a value of 160. We took a maintenance of 500, which covers everything. So the total cost per month is $2,500. Since it's a one bedroom condo, no rents attached to it. The monthly payment got to budget around $2,500. And again, as I said, it's a pure discretion. We're going to use, we're going to buy a condo. We're going to buy a house. Pure discretion based on the choice, based on the lifestyle. There's another condo we talk about. If it's for $520,000, 10% down payment, balance 468, CMHC fee, monthly mortgage payment of $2,200, property tax of 204, and maintenance of 598. These are the real properties, real values, what we've seen, 
what's prevalent in the market. So if you want to buy a two bedroom, two washroom in Mississauga, up to $520,000, the cost per month you've got to be budget is $3,000. This is some slide bullet text. I don't know what we need to slide in here. Technical aspects. Now we talk about the game changer. As I said about RRSP plan. Registered Retirement Savings Plan. All of you have come here to talk about or listen about home buying. If you are come here to listen about home buying, what is this RRSP thing doing here? What is the retirement thing has to do? I'm gonna, RRSP stands for Registered Retirement Savings Plan. Now, we're gonna take this discussion, how is this RRSP room created? Lot of you or few of you who joined from India, RRSP is similar to NSC, National Savings Certificates, or other government benefits. When you save in them, you have to pay less tax or people joined from US, it's like 401k. So RRSP room, assuming you came to the country in 2016 and your primary income was $50,000, okay? Your RRSP room becomes 18% of 50,000, which is 9,000. This is the way, step one, how RRSP room is calculated. RRSP, Registered Retirement Savings Plan. Let's suppose spouse, partner had an income of 30,000, RRSP room is $5,400. 18% of the earned income. So primary guy, primary person, 50,000 income, 18% is $9,000. 2017, income is 60,000, 18% is 10,800. 70, income is 70,000, 18% is 12,600. 70, again in 19, RRSP room is 12,600. So the primary income earner has a RRSP room of $45,000 calculated as 18% of the earned income and this rooms come available. So similarly, the partner income, 30,000 brings 5,400 room, another 30,000 brings 5,400, 40, 40 being 7,200. So the partner has a RRSP room for 25,200. Hope this calculation, which is nothing but 18% of the income, and it keeps on adding up is clear to everyone. Step two. So assuming you had the savings in your pocket, when you're planning to buy the house, assuming you had this money with you, one way of it is, giving this money directly as a down payment. Second way of it is by contributing to RRSPs, then we withdraw for the down payment and what we get is, we get a huge tax break. Huge tax break based on our income. Second, there's an increase in child tax benefit. If you have the kids. Third, it can be only done for first time home buying. So how it's gonna help us? Oops, I think there's some calculation which got mixed up. Let me please see. So we work on how RRSP room is calculated. 
second aspect we're going to work on is i think there is something missing here okay i'm going to explain it in the numbers so assuming in 2020 the income is again $70000 so assuming in 2020 income is again $70000 this person the first person we to talk about as primary income contributes $35000 to rrsp from his savings so income is 70000 and he contributes 35 the reason he contributes 35 is because that's maximum allowed limit so he contributes $35000 amazing thing happens his income for the purpose of taxes go down to 70 minus 35 35000 he gets a tax refund on 35000 of rrsps his tax level is 30% in ontario so 30% of that $35000 he gets a tax refund of Ten thousand dollars or more. By simple aspect of money sitting in savings, what is explained in this aspect? He did not give the money directly to the down payment. What he did is he contributed to the RRSPs, and what he got is tax refund for up to ten thousand dollars, which is. Thirty percent of the thirty-five thousand, but the when we talk about the spouse, the spouse can contribute twenty-five thousand dollars. So from their savings, they contributed thirty-five plus twenty-five. So what happened is the sixty thousand dollars generated them a tax refund. of at least $20000 in their bottom line plus the benefits like child tax benefit and stuff so why the 60 days is important right now is whatever your rrsp limit is you can go to the bank contribute it and when you do your taxes in march or april you're going to get tax refund instantly or taking this step further you can even borrow yes you're hearing it right you can even borrow money from the bank contribute to rrsps get your tax refund and you can pay off the loan or you can pay whatever you borrowed from the bank in order to consolidate it for your first time home buying so guys and gals rrsp concept one of the important aspect for saving for your down payment of your house it doesn't matter if i'm talking about a $45000 it doesn't matter if you're talking about $25000 if you want to buy a house with whatever amount of money of savings you can do my suggestion is you can start contributing to your rrsps whether it is $500 a month whether it is $1000 a month whether it is $100 a month or somebody who is a student to the country and want to start up if you cannot handle your $100 well you not be able to handle your million dollars well chetan ji i believe there is a questions flashing on the chat chetan ji we can't hear you sorry the first question is does it work the same way if you use tfsa okay no kaila it doesn't work the same way tfsa has a limit tfsa is tax free savings account there's a limit of $6000 and $6500 what you can save in tfsa whatever earn growth happens in tfsa is tax free you do not get a tax refund on tfsa 
that is what makes rrsp concept the unique concept so it doesn't wait work tfsa has a limit $6,500 a year or $6,000 a year. I believe for 2021, it's $6,000. So you can only contribute $6,000. But RRSP is 18% of the earned income. On RRSPs, you get a tax refund, which makes it unique. TFSA, you can have it second time, third time, nth time. RRSP, you can only have first time when you're buying the house. Simone, I got you. Please repeat the RRSP concept. Surely I will do it. Anything else, Chetanji? Anybody else has a question? Nothing. No. Perfect. Now, Simone, for you. First is the way we calculate it. Okay, if I open RRSP, Rekha has an account. If I open RRSP account now, can I get a tax rebate now? Yes, Rekha, you can get it now. I'll explain you right now. Let's assume, Rekha, this was your scenario, whether you came to the country in 16, 17, 18, 19, whatever. Okay, so whatever your income has been, if assuming you came to the country in 2016, your income was 50,000, or assuming you were born here and you have been working for 10 years, the way is whatever your RRSP room is. How do we know what my RRSP room is? If my RRSP room, I can check from the last year tax statement, notice of assessment I get from the government. If you open your notice of assessment on third page, it talks about how much you can contribute to your RRSPs. Okay, so assuming you have an RRSP limit of $100,000, okay? For a first time home buying, you can only contribute 35,000. If you have partner, great. If you do not have partner, it's all what you do it for yourself. So assuming I had an RRSP room for 100,000 and I wanna buy a house in which I'm planning to give a down payment of, let's suppose 90,000. So what I do is I take this $35,000, put it in your RRSPs, because I do it now, which is first 60 days. When I go in March to my tax accountant, I get that tax refund right away. Okay, so I contribute 35,000 to my, my, my account, my RRSPs, my registered retirement savings plan, and I get a tax from CRA tax refund of CRA based upon my marginal tax limit. So I get the tax refund right away in March. So I, and this money, which I contribute to my RRSPs, have to stay in RRSP account for 90 days and I can also take them back and use it for my down payment of my house. So bottom line, I put $35,000, let it stay in the account for 90 days, I take it out and I get a tax refund right away in the month of March or April when I go and do my taxes. Question from Simone. What if there's no partner income? Simon, if there's no partner income, that's fine. Uh, if the partner earned ever earlier, ever, you can try to see to take an advantage of that as well. If there's no partner at all, single person, fine as well. It's just if you have a spouse or a partner, uh, your common law who wants to buy with you, that's all. Marcella, very good question. Do you need to put the money, money back you got from RRSP? How about the tax implications? Very good question, Marcella. Do you need to put the money back? So if you put money to RRSPs, let's suppose 35,000 and you take it out, use it for the house, get a tax break. Government allows two year tax break. So 2021, 22 and 23, you do not have to put money back into your own account. 
but afterwards they give you 15 years to put it back 15 years to put it back let's assume you decide and you're one of the persons who want to save for the retirement rrsp is a great tool but let's assume you're from the other school of thought and you say i am not contributing back to my rrsps at all yes you may elect to do that as well the only difference is the balance whatever the rrsp is divided by 15 is going to be added to your income so you might have to pay a little bit of tax as well it is not mandatory that you have to these are tax strategies which you can use it for your benefit for your advantage what i say is we work 40 hours a week we work 50 weeks in a year so we work 2000 hours a year to earn money we should at least spend two the two hours a quarter two hours a quarter in order to grow our money in order to say how we can best use of our money what are the tax advantages we can take what are the best tax strategies remember it's the knowledge what makes the difference it's the knowledge what's going to give you better tools for planning i can see you have that inclination for the knowledge on a sunday morning where you can be watching the favorite soap opera or you can be watching tv maybe not, not as many games but you have here to attend the webinar Our, another wonderful question uh, i sold my house in winnipeg in 2019 Will I be considered first time home by Ontario? I do not have any other property in Canada. Paranjit, the answer is no, unfortunately. If you sold your property in 19, you have to wait for five years to be considered as first time home buyer because this first time home buyer is a federal credit given by the federal government. So if you sold it earlier and there was a five-year gap, yes, you can buy a property and gets the advantage of RRSPs. Okay. Now, guys, I hope RRSP cause concept was clear. Again, if you have any questions, any doubts, I'm going to be here after the end of the presentation and I'll be more than glad to help any one of you individually as well if you want to be talking on the Zoom call as such. Let's take the step further. The advantage, we contribute to our RSPs, we get a tax break, we get increase in child tax benefit. Okay, John has a very good question. I was told by mortgage broker that you can take loan from our RSPs even if you have not contributed no, John, the idea is you take a loan first, contribute to RRSPs, and then put it in 90, let it stay for 90 days, and you can take it back. Not loan from RRSPs, loan for RRSPs from your institutional bank, contribute to RRSPs, and then take it back. A little bit of tweaking required in that information. And a lot of people take that advantage because they take the loan from the bank, put it to RRSPs, take out the money from RRSPs, and they can even use that money for the down payment of the house. Jigasa says, which what is better? Jigasa, your question is, uh, does it mean buying first home after five years, I can be considered as a first time home buyer? got up to answering your question if you have sold a property and you have not owned the property for five years you are considered as a first time buyer in order to take advantage of rrsp concept 
Jigyasa has a question, which is interesting. Uh, what is better, semi-detach or detach, if it costs almost the same? Jigyasa, you got to show me where does it cost almost the same. I want to buy there too. But hold the thought, I'm going to come to the question. Let me just complete the concept. So guys, keeping it RSP savings, contributing retirement, we take tax break, increase in child tax benefit, increase in all benefits related to GST, HST, which can come to you. So for a first time buyer, it's the fantastic tool because the amount of money which you get as a tax refund is fantastic. Buyer services. What do we do with the buyer? If you are a buyer, if you plan to buy a house with my team, we conduct a buyer interview to educate you about the process, which we did it today. Second aspect, get you pre-approved for the mortgage. The one which is the biggest challenge in the mind of the buyer right now. How do we go and get it pre-approved? Very important, we get this approval done. We have all the information, whatever the wrinkles are. Remember I mentioned, if you are a consumer, if you are a buyer looking to buy a house, there is a product for you from the lender. But what happens is working on the mortgage is not when you look at the property and then go to the bank. Preparation is the key to success. Let's chat and work on how we can get the mortgage approval done. Third step, find the best house that matches your price selection, study and analyze the real estate market of your choice, guide you on that one. As I say, with Kitchener, it's London, we can talk about that. From Sayer to everyone, if I'm planning to buy in April 2021, then should I get the pre-approval? Yes, Sayer, in order to get the best rate in order to get the best advantage. If you're planning to buy a house in April of 2021, you should talk to your teammate. You should talk to the one who invited you here. What are the steps which are needed to be done in order for you to get the best possible rate and get you the mortgage approval? Yes, you should get it. Sorry, I meant 2022. Uh, for 2022, no, the pre-approval only lasts for four months. You should not work on pre-approval. What, what you need to work on is what you need to do. So in order you have a solid credit history. For an example, let's suppose you have one credit card, which is worth $50,000. Okay, you have one credit card, which is worth $50,000. You want to buy a house less than, for example, let's suppose at 5% down. When you go to the lender, the CMHC requirement says you need to have two different trade lines, two different credit cards, one credit card or one line of credit, one credit card or one loan. So even if you're planning to buy a house in April of 2021, the more effective planning you do now is what's going to make you efficient and successful in that time. Okay, you're welcome, Sir. Next aspect, handling all the closing details. Now, what my team will arrange for you. I know before you attended this webinar today, you were in your dreams, you were in your thoughts, you wanted to do, you wanted to buy a house, what to do, how to do, what to start, were all the questions. But what we can do it for you. What we do it for you is we help you plan for your success. What we do for you is all the services related to home buying process. As Sear wants to buy a house in 2022, we'll work with him, we'll suggest with him, plan for him what best we can do so that his transition or his dream of buying a house is easy, whether it's talking to a mortgage broker, whether talking to a lawyer, whether talking to a home inspector, whether talking to appraiser, accountant, banker, you have one number to contact in order to make sure you get the 
all the services under one roof. John, hold your thought. I'm going to come, come to this question. John has a question. What do you mean to have two credit cards? John, whenever we are going to CMHC, the government body, whenever we are going to CMHC, the government body, the government body says you need to have two different trade lines to reflect what is your behavior on borrowed money. So you, if you have to go to CMHC, whether you have two different trade lines, two credit cards, or one credit card and one line of credit in order to see your behavior on borrowed money. So they say you need to have two different trade lines. It could be two credit cards or one credit card and one line of credit or one credit card and one loan. So different tasks. Then. We talk about historical analysis. Since 2008, this has been the flow of what has been the values of the property in GTA. 2020 being a pandemic year has been third best year in the history of TREP in the number of sales. Just to give you the analysis of what has been the values. Again, one aspect, since 1968, when Toronto Real Estate Board has started to track the data, this has been the growing trend in the number of sales and the number of, and the price. If you see, it's only one time in 1988 when the values were at peak and after that, the recession came into the country and the country was hit with the worst possible recession. And the reason for that, if someone knows, the mortgage rates at that point were obnoxious, unbelievable. You're gonna see this in the numbers too. So what happened in 1988, the country was hit in recession and the values went down. But if you look at it typically, the rate of return in Toronto has been approximately, the growth is 6% per year. Every 12 years, the cost of properties double up. I know there are gonna be open forum questions on the state of the market which we briefly covered in this one, looking at the values which are increasing in last 12 years, looking at the number of sales which have happened in 2020 in spite of being pandemic year, it's a great opportunity to buy because of the fact the mortgage rates are at all time low. In my 17 years of career, I have not seen the mortgage rates as low as 1.49% for four years as well, offered by one of the major banks. One of another foreign banks was offering rates of less than 1%, which I've not seen in last 17 years of my working in real estate. When we talk about One of my favorite quotes, it says the difference between ordinary and extraordinary is that little extra. And I see that little extra in you 
for being available on Sunday morning, trying to spend, get the education for your benefit, see what it is. A journey of thousand miles starts with a single step. A collection of single drops is what makes the bowel, what makes the whole things glow. So that I see a little extra in you to spend the time to gain the knowledge. Guys, the floor is gonna be open. We do a lot of webin sem webinars. We do it on the investment properties as well. I see somebody asking the question. So if you're interested, you can please follow us on the YouTube channel. The YouTube channel gives a lot of information. Every month we post the updates on the market report. It's a video which talks about what is the state of the market, what are the benefits for the buyers, what are the benefits for the sellers, how we should plan all those advantages. You can follow us on the Instagram for the latest listings which are there. Whatever properties we're gonna put on the market, the first place to get the attention is the Instagram, instant. You can follow us on the team page at the, at the Facebook, at Team Sunny Bedi for all the updates. Now I leave it to Chaitanya Ji for next course of action. And also if there are any questions, please feel free and I'm going to be answering individual questions as we go along. Sunny, there are two questions at the bottom from John and Rekha. Could you please answer that out? Sure. I need some technical help from Deepak, I believe here, because if you can read me the... Yeah, yeah. If yeah you can the first read question is, is, it's two credit cards for each spouse. Yes, for all the lenders, all the borrowers. If there are two borrowers or if there are three borrowers, two credit cards, two lines of credit, two trades for each borrower. And can you read me the second question, please? I have a credit card and a car. Is that considered as two line of credits? Yes, if you have a credit card and car loan, if your car is paid off, if your car is paid up, that's not a line of credit. That's not a second trade line. If you have a car loan, yes, that makes it a second trade. Guys, thanks a lot for being the part of this uh, webinar. Really appreciative of your time. And as we say, if you wanna have any questions, individual to your needs, any aspect, we'll be here to answer that. I'm just gonna take a break, I believe for two minutes and uh, I'll be back. And uh, I believe Chetna Ji has some next round of questions to be done. So I leave it to you and I'll be back after two minutes for the questions. Go ahead. Thank you, Sunny Ji, for the wonderful presentation and answering a lot of questions. And I hope you guys got a lot of information today. So now it's time for my questions, not for yours, but you, Sunny Ji will answer other questions later on. So we have uh, a small quiz today. So I will ask some questions and you need to answer the question by texting me. I'm sharing my phone number on Zoom chat. So the first person who will be sending me the right answer will get a, a prize today. And uh, that will be a Google Nest Mini. So you can collect that uh, uh, after the webinar from our office. So I hope uh, you will, I will be getting the answers soon. So my first question is, what is the amount of RRSP deduction limit for year 2020 if my income is 200,000 for 2020? So what is the amount of RRSP deduction limit for year 2020 if my income for 2020 is 200,000? 35,000. You can text me on my cell and uh, then uh, I can, we can choose the winners. And please write your names as well while texting me.
Vietnam? I got two. I got uh, three answers, but uh, nothing is correct as of now. Chetna ji. Yes. I have got three. Oh, you also got three. So, did you got the right answer? Uh, everybody is saying thirty-five thousand. Okay. Any other answers? Thirty-six, thirty-five thousand, thirty-six thousand is not the right answer. Yeah. Anyone else? Wow, it's an amazing response, but I'm not getting the right answer. <laughs> Okay, can I have your name? This iPhone, who is uh, who is sent a message for twenty six thousand? Naveen. Naveen, you are very close actually, but uh, this is again uh, not the correct answer. Twenty six five thousand. Okay, the question is again. Uh, okay, I can repeat the question. I have uh, shared on Zoom chat as well. What is the amount of RRSP deduction limit for year twenty twenty? If my income for twenty twenty is two hundred thousand. Ah, Chetna. Yeah. Or uh, uh, one guy, uh, Anika. Thirty-six thousand. Okay, thank you, Anika. Thanks for sending the messages. I got the message from a uh, lot of people, but uh, I didn't receive any right uh, answer. Okay, we'll uh, talk about the right answers later on. My next question is: By thumb rule, how much is the approximate closing cost? If the purchase point point is purchase price is seven hundred and twenty thousand, we learnt about this in the webinar. So, how much would be the approximate closing cost if the purchase price is seven hundred and twenty thousand? Okay, so okay, ten thousand. Okay, so the, I got like the first answer from Gaurav Saxena. He, I think, he might write the answer. Uh, he missed one number. So the right answer is ten thousand and eight hundred. And the first person who sent me this answer is Hukum. So Hukum, can I, you are the winner for this. So this is one point five percent of seven hundred and twenty thousand. So it's ten thousand eight hundred. So God, of you have missed one zero. So I'm so sorry for that. <laughs> so who come? You will talk to you later on, and we will. You can collect the gift from our office. Okay. And the third question is, uh, what are the three major components of monthly budget for freehold property? What are the three major components of monthly budget for freehold property? Chetna. Yes. Anika uh, replied, uh, "It's mortgage, property tax, and utilities." Okay, that's great. So, uh, Anika, you will be the winner for this one. This question. Thank you so much for answering. Okay, now it uh, looks very uh, good that you all are responding very fast. Uh, I will ask one more question. What is the historical highest average mortgage interest rate in Canada? We didn't discuss this on the webinar, but. If somebody knows, eighteen percent. Somebody texted. Thank you. Eighteen 
eighteen percent again. Okay, somebody texted me. It's Yatin, twenty one point seven five percent. So that's the right right answer. So Yatin, you will be the winner for this one. Thank you so much for participating. And it's really uh, okay. The first question is left. Uh, nobody answered the right answered that right. So that is what is the amount of RSP deduction limit for year twenty twenty if the income for twenty twenty is two hundred thousand. So the maximum amount of RSP deduction for twenty twenty is twenty seven thousand two thirty. If you will Google it, you can know know about it. So you can't uh, do more than this. Thank you, everyone, for participating. And the winners will collect can collect their gift from our office. They can contact me. Oh, you did answer it above. Let me please announce the winners again. Okay, so somebody answered. Uh, oh, I didn't check it. So our RSP limit is twenty seven to thirty. So that's good. So Naveen, you can also collect the gift for this question as well. And uh, for first question, the winner is Naveen. For second question, winner is. Uh, let me see. Hukum. For third question is Anika, and uh, for fourth question is Yatin Kira. Thank you so much, everyone. And now, if you have any questions for Sunny, you can please feel free to ask. And thank you again for joining today. And be part of this webinar. Any questions? Uh, guys, I'm back. If you have any individual questions, we can wait. You can text along or you can chat. Thank you, Rekha. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your feedback. Really appreciate it. Thanks for everyone. Uh, if there's any important mm -hmm. question in in your to individual needs. You can reach Chetna. You can call us, or you can text, and we can discuss it from there. Till the so, time we meet again, have a fantastic day, evening, and keep safe. Stay safe. Important aspect: the cases are rising. Be safe, and till we meet again in person or we are the use of technology. Take care. Bye, bye, everyone. Have a fantastic day. Take care. Sunny, there was one more question. Oh, sure, sure. Go ahead. The question is from Anika and it reads, is it better to get a pre-approval from a broker or a bank? And is it true that the more pre-approvals you do, the worse credit score you have? Uh, Anika, first of all, you do not need to have more pre-approvals. The best piece of advice is you pull up your own credit history it cost $23.95 from Equifax, does not make any effect to your credit history. So you pull up one credit history from Equifax, you do it yourself, you pay $24, it doesn't hurt your credit score at all. Take that and you can discuss it with your realtor. You take that, discuss it with your mortgage broker because you have income and you say, okay, now let's plan what should we do and how should we do right you do not have to go to number of mortgage brokers at all of course you can discuss with a couple of people uh, great idea not uh, you know to have your inputs on what best you can do but you should not allow a lot of people to pull your credit by spending again 24 bucks you can have your credit pulled up by your own choice from the borrow lending from credit institution, uh, Equifax, and you're good to go. You do not have to work with a lot of uh, credit brokers and allow them to pull your credit. Sunny, there is one more question. One more question. Sure. Can I ask about the mortgage pre-approval? If the pre-approval will be 500K and you will put 10% down, how much is the amount of the house you need to buy? Are you? Uh, can I ask about mortgage pre-approval? If pre-approval will be 500 and you put 10%, how much is the amount of the house you need to buy? Uh, some, 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 some facts, let, let, let me understand. Uh, you're putting 10% down payment. 
So the pre-approval is 500,000 and he can add 10% down payment. So what would be the purchase price? 550 then. Yeah. 550, 560. I hope I'm able to answer that uh, question. Wow. Now we see the Hangama Ho Gaya as well. Lovely songs, wonderful. All right, guys, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach your uh, guests who invited you and uh, they can give that to me. We can have a word or we can have a phone call and we can address your questions individually. Take care, stay safe. Bye-bye.